Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the study of Joshua. I hope you are well. I know as a matter of fact that you are well because our God keeps you. Welcome to class this morning. We are going to be looking at Joshua chapter 7. Last week we looked at Joshua chapter 6 and we saw how Jericho fell. And we did learn a number of things from that class. Chief of the class was that every step of the way they had, there were instructions. And as long as Joshua and his men followed the instructions, everything went smoothly. And um, we saw that um, it was going to be the year, the season we're entering is going to be the season of reverse orders. And yesterday I did receive a testimony that blew my mind, mirroring from start to finish the, the, the season when obsolete things will be called back to life. And listening to that testimony or reading that testimony strengthened me in my inner man that we are on to something here if we we'll pay attention and do how heaven is requiring of us to do. Before we start this class, please share the link so that your brothers and your sisters will come in and be part of this class. If you know someone who is not following the study of the book of Joshua, you need to take the time and explain to them why they need to follow this lesson. There is something about this book that if we get, it won't be the entire, um, it won't be everything taught, but there are things he's highlighting per chapter that if we pay attention to in our nest, our lives will be better off for it. Before we go into class this morning, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the opportunity of another time to study at your feet. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done from um, when we started the study of Joshua from chapters 1 through to 6. And thank you, Lord, for what you do you will do today in, on, as we open our, our hearts and our spirits to study chapter 7. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit will be the teacher in this place. And Lord, whatever it is amongst this entire chapter that is useful for our journey for the next especially, you open our, high, our eyes and our spiritual understanding to be able to grasp in the name of Jesus. Lord, I surrender my faculties and everything before you this morning, and I ask that I will be a vessel, and only a vessel, Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, Lord, that your name will be glorified. Yes. Thank you, God of heaven, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. amen and amen. Thank you again, and thank you for joining the class. Um, it's a study of the book of Joshua chapter 7, and it's... Um, it's a long chapter, so I'm going to dive right into it and trust that um, we would get where we need to go in this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you open to the book of Joshua chapter 7, if you remember in Joshua chapter 6, Jericho had fallen. Now they are about to take the city of I or A. It's a small city 
and um, just after Jericho and Joshua and his men wanted to take that city. Let's see how that unfolds. Remember that in Joshua chapter 6, I believe it was verse 16, God was very clear about what he called the accursed things. And I actually think I should begin from there. Joshua chapter 16, um, ch chapter 18 actually says, And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed when ye take of the accursed thing, and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. And what, one of the things that I said last week um, or in the last class is that it was the principle of the first. I think a day later something popped up in the in the in the comments and I saw that someone was disputing that that was not the first city that they took that was the first city they took by battle across the Jordan it was the first city they took in the main promised land the promised land was across the Jordan they had surround um, land and of Manasseh God and another, um, I can't remember the other tribe now had received a location of land on the other side of the Jordan. But in coming into the promised land proper, um, the first city that they took was Jericho. And I was telling us that the Bible is very clear that whatever opens the womb belongs to God. The principle of what we now call the first fruit. And God was very clear in Joshua chapter 6, verse number 18, that nothing in Jericho should they take. They can take the silver, the gold, and the precious things for the treasury of the Lord. But every other thing was supposed to come before God as a bond offering. If you understand the principle of the bond offering in the Bible, bond offerings don't leave anything for the offerer to eat. It is something that God alone consumes. But what we found was that there was someone who did not follow through on the instructions. Let's quickly go to Joshua chapter 7, beginning from verse number 1. It says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in their cause thing. For Achan, the son of Kamai, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of their cause thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Verse number two, and Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Bethelvin, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the children, all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are few. I want to spend my time in, from verse 1 to verse 3, first and foremost. In verse 1, he says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass. But he goes on to explain this trans trespass, and it wasn't the children of Israel. It was one man, Achan, the son of Carmen, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah that took their cursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. In our nest, remember, I believe it was the second, it was the second class or the third class. I talked about um, collaboration. That in the new that God is doing for us, post all of this that we are going through right now, what the Lord expects of the body is a collaborative body. A body where the hand will not say to the leg, I don't need you. A body where the leg will not say to the eyes, I don't need you. But that if we come together and we forge our strength together, then we'll be able to do more for kingdom than we had ever done in all the ages combined that had gone past previously. And so you find that it's supposed to be an age of collaboration. So we see that Achan was the one that broke the hedge. But everyone is now in trouble. The Bible says everyone committed a trespass. And as I looked at this and I started to speak to the Holy Spirit, I was wondering, why would one man do something and everyone would have to pay? Why would one man do something and everyone would have to pay for it? 
And what the Bible, what the Holy Spirit said to me is that that's the point of the body. That's the point of the body. That's the point of the body. If you cut your finger and you cut it deep enough, it can make your head ache. The entire body is one. Whether you are Baptist or you're four square, or you're redeemed or you are trem or you are deeper or whatever. If we see ourselves from the place of we're one, then there are things we must do in this next season. And as we go on, I'll talk about it. So what I'm seeing here is that there is trouble in the camp. Actually, that's what I call this, this, um, this particular uh, chapter, trouble in the camp. Here comes trouble. Trouble shows up just because Achan is in the camp. Incidentally, the, man, the name Achan means trouble. So he was named for his destiny, apparently. The name Achan meant trouble. So he was named for his, um, his destiny. Now, be, just because the Lord brought us through, we not mean that there won't be a few troubles around us as we go into the new. What we want to be sure is we're paying attention and we're doing what we must do to ensure that the trouble of one does not overwhelm all. So Achan was the one that took up their costing, but the entire, the anger of God was kindled against the entire nation of Israel. You know how they say that when one finger, finger touches oil, it soils all the others. This is exactly, a, this is a typical example of that. Then in verse number two it said, and Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside, you know, so number one, what affects one affects all. What affects one affects one, all. So if you are in a household, and when I say in a household, let's begin from the smallest unit, which is the family. And one person is consistently breaking the hedge and everyone else is either covering up for them or winking at it. When they hit the fan, it will be everyone who gets to suffer it. So this is not the time that we, we explain nonsense away. This is the time that the Bible is very clear, correct in love. We must be clear and we must hoist our flags and set our parameters very high. Let everyone know that there are certain lines in our households that cannot be crossed. Because if you open yourself, yourself up and you allow people who have no boundaries, come and abuse boundaries under your, under your leadership or under your cover or whatever, when the day of reckoning comes, you will be a partaker. So that's the first warning that the Lord is sounding today. In verse number two, we see how Joshua planned to take Ai. What does he do? He calls two men again and he says, go and do a recon of the city. Go check it out and come back and tell me how we ought to progress. The Bible said they went and they came back in verse number three and they said, it doesn't make sense that all of us go. Let only about 2,000 or 3,000 men go because it's a really small city. We should be able to take it with one hand tied behind our backs. Essentially, they presumed just because you've heard so many nice things and great things for the next, just because you're hearing that there is a revival on the outskirts, just because you're hearing that things are going to change in our nest, is not an invitation to not go back to God for instructions. In our fourth class or so, I did say many, many, many times that instructions are critical for our nest. Joshua, the way Joshua, you know, when you look at Joshua's leadership, the way Joshua thrived and grew and strengthened his people and took the land, led them to take all of the land that God asked them to take, was that Joshua did nothing except the Lord told him to do it. But there are two instances in the book of Joshua that we find that Joshua did not go back for instructions. He did not inquire of the Lord. And because he did not inquire of the Lord, he had hell to pay for it. This was the first one. The, um, the, 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 um, when in chapter 2, the, um, what are they, the spies came back in chapter 1 and said, we can take that land. And in chapter 2, before they went out at all to do anything, before they started to plan to go and take Jericho, or was that in chapter 3? I forget now. 
what we saw was that God spoke something to Joshua. And I want to believe that the reason God spoke something to Joshua was because Joshua asked God. Joshua consistently went back to God. But in this time, they just came and said to him, you know what? There's no big deal. They are just, it's a small city. We can take it. Let's send about 2,000 and 3,000 men. And Joshua took the word of man above the word of God. Joshua took the word of man above the recommendation of God. You will say, but God didn't make any recommendation. Yes, because we didn't ask him. So in our nest, we want to make sure that we are very careful to ask the instructions that we need for the nest. Don't presume that just because two weeks ago you went to this one particular office and you got business and there was a process that you went through. Don't assume and presume that this next time that will be exactly how God wants you to do it. Do you ever say it like this? It is not one way that leads to the market. So we want to make sure that we consistently go back to God so that we are sure that the instructions that we have and not the instructions of the last season. Now, why did this happen? Because if you don't understand why it happened, you'll think Joshua had turned. Joshua didn't turn, but this happens to the best of believers, and you need to pay attention. For many years, I have always told people that the time that a believer needs to be most careful is after a victory. A moment you finish a great victory, the, ten the tendency is you become what I call unconsciously negligent. It's not a decision you consciously make to be negligent or reckless, but you just find yourself not pushing anymore. I mean, I've done six chapters, and in every one of those chapters, I went to God. Surely, if I don't go to God in this one, he will do what he will do. After all, God has promised us that in this next season, we were going to come into great things. Yes, God did say so. It, was, it is his word, and God is faithful to perform what he has spoken. But where Joshua became negligent was he didn't go to God and say, how are we going to do about I? And I'm saying that this is not peculiar to Joshua, and this is something you want to pay attention to. When you get out of this into the nest, whatever your nest will look like, you must be very careful to pay attention. You must be very careful to pay attention. And in paying attention, what you are listening for is, Lord, thank you for the last victory. What are we going to do about this nest battle? But Joshua did not do it like that. He presumed, and that means that when you presume that what God did in the last season is how God will do in this next season, you are unconsciously negligent. You are not paying attention enough to the things that God wants you to pay attention to. And if you do not pay attention enough to the things that God wants you to pay attention to, the tendency is you will miss a, num a lot of things at best. And at worst, you will actually get in trouble. So when you make it out of COVID-19, and you will because God is the one watching over you, don't take it for granted. Do not take it for granted. Do not sit down and think it is because you have muscle. Do not think, sit down and think that it is because your immunity was one of the greatest immunities on planet Earth. Do not think it was because you obeyed social distancing rule better than anyone else. The Bible says it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. After this time out, what you should be doing is asking God, why did you preserve me? To what end did you preserve me? Lord, why did you leave me here for such a time as this? If you would ask that simple question, the tendency, and I'm sure the it's not a tendency. The assurance that I can give you is God will speak to you while you are here now. And so you need to pay attention. You need to ask questions. But what did Joshua do? Verse number four. So they went up thither of the people, about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And, of the, men, and the men of Ai smote them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate unto Shebarim and smote them in going down. Wherefore, the hearts of the people melted and became as water. 
because Joshua was unconsciously negligent. That is, this was not a determined negligence. This was not Joshua saying, I don't need God. This was Joshua assuming and presuming that because God gave them a promise and took them through Jericho, it was going to be easy to take Ai. And because of that, they lost 36 men. <coughs> now, when you think that the children of Israel, the people of Israel were a lot of people, even of the ones that went to battle, about 3,000 went to battle. If you lose 36 out of 3,000, it isn't such a bad thing. But that's because you are not paying attention. Because if you are paying attention to recognize that God is the one that told them to go take this land. God made Joshua a promise. He said, there shall be no man able to stand before you. And now in the very second battle, they lose 36. From, to a really small city. If you were Joshua and if you were one of the people of Israel, you ought to be worried. Because if, we, if they lose 36 this time, how many will they lose the next time? Because it will mean that if God said to them, I will be with you, don't be afraid. You would win every battle. No man will be able to stand before you. And now on the second, at the second battle, they lose 36 men. It could actually mean that God was not with them, which exactly was the point. God was not with them. So if the people's heart had not failed them, I would have thought that these people were not paying attention to what God was doing. But thank God they paid attention. The Bible said even though it was 36 men, their hearts melted and became as water. <laughs> and Joshua was so distraught that he rent his clothes, fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us, would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. Joshua could not understand it. We just came out of Jericho. Because remember that Joshua had instructions. Make sure nothing is taken. Just accept what God asked them to take for put in, in the treasury of God. Joshua didn't take anything. Joshua wasn't the one that sinned. Yet, Joshua is the one that has to explain to the people why they have come, calamities come upon them. Leaders, pay attention. Don't treat sin with kids' gloves. Because you will be the one that will stand before God and you will be the one that will go before the people to explain what went wrong. Joshua could not have known that Achan took what he wasn't supposed to take. But maybe if Joshua had gone, done what he should do and asked God, should we go to A, go and take I today or should we go tomorrow or the day after? Perhaps God would have told Joshua because God spoke to Joshua consistently. Joshua, you can't go up now. There is evil in the camp. Trouble literally is in your camp. You can't go up. But that wasn't what happened. Because Joshua didn't ask God said, well, it's early in the day, but maybe if they learned the lesson early in the day, they will truly learn it. In verse number 8, Joshua said, O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it, and they shall environ us run. They will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will thou do unto thy great name? Joshua was saying, Lord, this is not good. If after what happened in Jericho, this is what is happening. This land, these people, the people in the promised land that have, the Bible said that their lever had failed them. They will get their lever back. And if they get it back, they are going to deal with us. Lord, this was not good for your reputation at all. Lord, this is not good for a God who told us that we were going to go and take the land. Joshua was distraught. And Joshua was crying out. I want to stop and say every disobedience is detrimental. In our nest, every disobedience is detrimental. 
Achan stole is resined. Achan stole is resined. Achan stole is resined. How? Achan stole is resined. Achan stole is resined. There is no disobedience. No disobedience. That is not detrimental. There is nothing like small disobedience. There is nothing like big disobedience. There is nothing like, ah, this disobedience is this tiny one. And this disobedience, oh no, it was only one Achan that took one thing. Or took two things. Or took three things. It was that one man out of about four million. But every disobedience is detrimental. There is a need in this season for us to recognize that we are connected. And therefore, the decision I make in my house today can affect all of us. If I decide not to live pure and holy, if I decide to double in things, whether you like it or not, somehow you are drinking from a spiritual well that I have do- the Lord has enabled me to dig. What that automatically means is that you will be drinking from polluted so- sources. Or from a polluted source. So every disobedience is detrimental. We must recognize that we are connected. And therefore we cannot afford to cause a ripple effect of trouble in the camp. One sinner destroys much good. That's the way the Bible says it in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. One sinner in the camp can destroy a lot of good. So you want to be make sure that you are not the weak link in the camp. You are not the weak link in the army. Achan wasn't paying attention to this and he became the weak link. But let us go on. Verse number 10, God responds to Joshua. And what does God say? He says, get thee up. Wherefore lies thou thoughts upon thy face? He was like, there's trouble in your camp. You are sleeping. You think hey, this is me? This is all you and your brothers and your sisters. There is something you have done that has opened you up to this. If you want this not to repeat itself, get up from where you are and go and find out what the issue is. Get up from where you are and go and find out what the issue is. Verse 11, Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they, it's amazing. It was, Achan did not even hold, send a WhatsApp message to three of his friends to say, you know what, I am going to sin. What do you think? That, that his friends advised him and said, Achan, don't do it all. But the problem is that they did not report to Joshua. That's not what happened. Achan did not tell anyone. He just went and he took. But the Lord says, Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my commandment, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of their accursed thing. And they have also stolen and dissembled also. And they have put it even among their own stuff. Uh -uh. Maybe we need to remind God again. Lord, it was only a can. Therefore, The children of Israel could not stand before their enemies. Number two, I want you to pay attention to this. If you want to be able to stand before the resistance that is sure to come, because just because we are in a new and the Lord is doing great things, does not mean that the devil is going to fold his hands and give up his ministry. To be able to stand before your enemy, make sure that you are aligned with God. Because no alignment with and to God, no capacity to stand before the enemy. Verse 12 said, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies. But they turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy their accursed from amongst you. Guys, this is your Bible. I know New Testament pundits will be saying, oh, this is the Old Testament. It doesn't matter. I don't have energy to argue with you. 
But I know that in my house, as Jesus helps us, we will be paying attention. Many, many, I've done, I've been, I've done many, many events for kingdom in the last 12 years or more. I've done many, many, many events. I actually think that I've done more events than I've done anything else. And every time I gather a team of volunteers, I usually beg them not to be the Akan in the camp. I beg them to make sure that in the time that they put their hands to the plow to work with us, they should please live above and beyond reproach. So that they are not the reason why the entire bunch is weakened. The Bible says it like this. A little living, living at the door. You don't want to be the reason why an entire nation, an entire body of Christ is falling on his face. We have had to go through many of the things we've gone through in this season because we became unconsciously negligent. We thought to ourselves that at, at, at least they are not in my church. And as long as they are not in my church, I'm fine. But look at it now. Everyone is paying a price because we did not call out the things we were supposed to call out. We decided that it was easier. And I know it actually is. To blend into the word in the name of trying to bring them to Christ rather than stand out amongst them and hold up the light and say, Here's the light come out of darkness. So we tailored our messages to make them feel good about themselves. We joined them to say that judge, we shouldn't judge people because, but the Bible is very clear. The Bible did not say that we are the ones that say they are judged already. So when someone is an Achan in your camp, it is not a judgment. It is just telling them how the end is likely to be for them. This is the time where the church of Jesus Christ must be courageous. Speak up against evil. Don't go there and take gifts from them and forget that the reason why you had made the journey to go visit them in the first place is to tell them that there is evil and the Lord is not pleased. Because these things will not stop. But we are the voice and we must speak it right. That means that you do not speak it and then go up behind and do it. Ensure that your walk and your talk are aligned. Israel became an accursed nation or accursed people in one night because one man could not contain his greed. And because there was no one to say to him, stop. My prayer is that if it is your responsibility to say stop, that it will not be too much of a problem for you to say stop in the name of Jesus. Amen. Verse number three, the Lord says, sanctify the people and say, sanctify, it says, to, um, it says up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus said the Lord, the God of Israel, there is an accosting in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thy enemies until ye take away the accosting from among you. The Bible has a scripture, verse, that captures this in one sentence. It says it like this, sin is a reproach to a nation. Sin is a reproach to a people. Sin is a reproach to the church. Wherever sin thrives, there will be trouble. The Bible says that God is coming back for a church that is without spots, blemish, unwrinkled. If you take what Achan did in the midst of, even if it was a million people, one man's sin ought to be just a a spot or a wrinkle. But because of that wrinkle, the entire nation was rejected. The entire nation couldn't stand before God. The entire nation couldn't face their enemies. Instead, they turned their back on the enemies. And the enemy had a field day. 36 men down. 
Verse 14, in the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes. And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof. And the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households. And the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with their cost in shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he hath, because he had transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he had wrought folly in Israel. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes. Here is when you know that Achan was trouble original. By the time they started to call the tribes to come out, that was the time, if Achan did not recognize before then that what he had done was bad, that was the time for him to own up. But Achan waited. They plowed through 12 tribes. Achan waited. They plowed through their, each family of the, his tribe. Achan waited. They plowed through his family and then they got to him. Kai, no. That cannot be. The Bible says it like this. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. <laughs> hey, you see, if there was anything at all that God is calling us to in our nest, it is a life of purity and holiness. I know a lot of us say that these things are not possible anymore. I think that by the help of the Holy Spirit, they are more than possible. Not to get into the place of willful disobedience. If we were in doubt that what had happened with Achan was he made a mistake, this attitude clears it that it was not a mistake. It was a deliberate act. So he brought the family of Judah. No, so Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes. And the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah and he took the family of the Zahats. And he brought the family of the Zahats, man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmen, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was taken. Verse 19, and Joshua said unto Achan, my son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now, what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. Did someone need to honestly beg Achan to do this? But isn't that how we all do? That's how we all did in the last dispensation. And that's how we must not do in the next. Whatever your next normal would look like, sin cannot be a part of it. And Achan answered Joshua and said, verse 20, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment, he had to be Babylon, right? And two shekels, hundred shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of fifty shekels weight. Then I converted them, and then took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth, in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. Hallelujah. Every scene is progressive. I keep telling people that nobody wakes up one day and commits adultery. That's not the way it works. Adultery does not fall on people. It begins by somebody looking too long upon what wasn't his to look at. Then, because he had looked and looked and looked and looked, he begins to covet or desire it. Then, ultimately, he makes a decision to take it. Every sin has these three components. First, you see. Next, you covet. Third, you take. First, you see. Next, you covet. Third, you take. If I want to say it in, in, um, if in consultancy language, it will be the three Ds of sin. Desire is the first one. You desire it. Then you fall into the deception like when I take that covetousness. If I take it, no one will know about it. 
And then ultimately you make the decision to take it. Every sin has that level. If you go to Genesis chapter 3, it was exactly the anatomy of the sin that um, Eve committed. She saw the fruit that it was good. From seeing it, she began to desire it and it would be something, something. And then ultimately she took it and she ate it. And it was easy from that point on for Adam to eat. That's why the Bible says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. And I shall not look. It begins by seeing. Put filters on your computer in the next season if you don't have them. You know, I, I, I am a Netflix buff. And what I find is that since I started to watch, watch Asiatic movies and I watch romance flicks amongst them, that is all that Netflix uh, recommends to me. It's the same thing if you watch something on Netflix that is pornography based. Going forward, every day, every week, Netflix will send you a prompt of new pornographic material that has just been uploaded or that is trending that you have not seen. Once you know that you have the capacity or you have the weakness of setting your eyes and not being, being able to take your eyes off, what should you do? Uninstall the app. Uninstall the app. If the person that you are looking at is a relationship at work, you want to put buffers between you and them. You can't sack them, obviously, because it's probably not in your power to do. But those are not the people you go to lunch with every day. Those are not the people you give a ride every day. Be wise. Keep evil far away from you. That's how the Bible says it. Put filters. Block those people who have the pr proclivity of sending you all the wrong things. Block them on WhatsApp. They will keep sending. It just will no longer get to you. If you cannot block them, put that thing that everybody ha can put on their WhatsApp. Even on Facebook, you, there is a way you set up from your um, settings and your videos don't automatically play. On WhatsApp, it doesn't matter what you send to me. It doesn't automatically download. Unless I feel like I should do that. I want to download it. I have put a filter. And my own wasn't even so much about sin. It was just, I, I said to myself, my eyes shall not see corruption. There are things that abuse my sensitivity that do, do not abuse the sensitivities of others. So I shall not be paying attention to those things. So if there is a filter, I will take it. I belong in groups, alumni associations, for instance, that I, I, do, not, I do not read. Because there's always that one person who has no filters and no boundaries. I, they are adults. I cannot legislate for them what they want to do with their time, their money, and their data. But I decided that not even downloading is not good enough for me. I will not read. If it is important, someone will prompt me to say this is important. Put your filters down. Put them down. Because the scene will always begin from a sight. You were just driving past and you saw it. Then you said, oh, I saw something it looks like. The next time you won't drive as fast, you will slow down to take another look. For the next one week or one month, all you are doing is taking a look at it. One day it will be time for you to stop and walk in and see what they actually are doing there. Do you honestly want to find out? Let's put these filters in place. Let's go on. Verse number 22. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran into the tent. And behold, it was hid in his tent and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all the all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah 
and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and all and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Acre. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire. After they had stoned them with stones, and they raised over them a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of the place was called the Valley of Acre, unto this day. I'm going to come to that point because, yes, we don't stow people to death anymore. We're not in the Old Testament where judgment was instant. Jesus is taking all of our judgments, but there is a need for repentance. What I saw was that Achan confessed, but he did not repent. In his conversation, I did not see, I am sorry. He said, I saw, I coveted, I took. What Achan did was he recanted everything at the facts of the case. There was nothing that pleaded. There was nothing that said he put ashes on his head to begin to say, I am so sorry that I'm the one that did this. But I was just talking and I now want to go to my notes. Number one, I did say to us that every of disobedience is detrimental. And that because we are connected, we need to pay attention. We cannot be unconsciously negligent. Number two, I talked about the fact that sin comes in stages. Every sin is a stage. And you need to recognize that temptation will not cease because it is the season of the new. But temptation will continue to thrive because that is the ministry of the devil and God is not going to just lock him up today simply because you are in, your, in a new season. If you open the door and allow the desires and your sight and all of those things to rule, it will mess us up just the same way it messed us up in the last season. My prayer is that God will help us in Jesus' name. Watch your desires. They lead to, dis, to deceit, which leads to the need to make a decision. And this decision usually bets sin. And there is only one end to sin. It is death. The Bible says the soul that sin it shall die. The third thing I want you to see from this chapter is that not every prayer is pure. Simply because we all gather and we begin to pray and say, Lord, have mercy. You know that the people who are the courage they are causing are the ones to first shout, Lord, have mercy. How do I know? Joshua was truly distraught in his spirit. But there was Achan in that same camp who knew what he had done. I'm sure he was joining all of them to say, Father, have mercy. What Achan did not bet on was that there would be a revealing on that day. Just because all of us come and gather prayer meeting. In a prayer meeting does not mean that all of us are doing what God wants us to do. What does this even mean for me? And what does it mean for you? It means that your capacity to discern by the Holy Spirit is required in your nest. The spirit of discernment is critical. You cannot get out of your house and go and take people as face value. Face value will hurt you. So be very careful. Every prayer is not pure. Even though Joshua didn't take instructions leading to the battle of Ai, he came and he was praying and said, Lord, look now what will happen to your name. And it's a great thing that he could pray at that point, but he knew to run back right to God. But it would have been greater if he had, at the beginning, he had gone to God to say, ah, God, we finished Jericho. Thank you so much. What should we do about the next city? Who even knows? God may say it's not time for Ai yet. God could have said, oh, Achan has something that you need to bring forth. Let me quickly go on because of time. God already knew what Joshua only just found out. Isn't that a good enough reason to begin the process with him? If you understand that God knows the end of a thing from the beginning, it is the more reason why we must always go back to him to get our instructions and not just think that just because and in primary two, this was how I did it. In primary four, that's how I would do it. It's not always the case with God. The fourth thing that I want to say to you is that every prayer isn't for, every failure isn't forever. Every failure isn't forever. 
by the time they go through this repentance and putting their costing out, in chapter 8, you will say, see that they not only beat I. Something interesting happens in chapter 8. God actually told them, everything you find in I, take for yourself. Delayed gratification. This is not the season where I must have it and have it now. God operates with us in stages and in processes. So it is essential that you submit to the process. If Achan had just waited 24 hours more, or maybe one month, I don't know what the time lapse, lapse was. <coughs> Achan would have carried out of I whatever caught his fancy. And guess what? He would not have had need to bury it. Why do you want to steal what you can't even use? Achan stole it. He didn't even have the liberty of displaying it in his tent as poise of battle. He dug the bottom, the, the ground, and kept and hid it. So what was the point of stealing it? For us to recognize that some of the things we think we must have, just as we get out of this Isolation and social distancing. If we wait for another two weeks, you'll find out that you don't need them actually. You will find out that you don't need them actually. Remember that after every victory is a great, great, great time of vulnerability. Do not make mistakes. Do not make mistakes. Do not make mistakes. My brothers and my sisters, Sanctification is the way. You need to understand that no matter what happens, in the next, God is doing uniquely great things. And because we are in his ambassadors in the earth, how we'll embrace these things and how we'll put them on display and how we transact with these things that the Lord is doing will determine how the world in general will take it. I have made a decision in my heart and I, I think that ought to be your decision. Not to be the reason why men cannot embrace God in the nest. That will not be me. Whatever it will take for me to be that person who can lead others to Jesus Christ. And my attitude will not rub them the wrong way. And my business dealings with them will not make them disrespectful of God. I will want to do everything that I can to make sure that I'm standing. Now, if you ask me, why couldn't God just ask them to destroy the things and then leave Achan alone? Or why didn't they just destroy Achan and leave his family alone? Because Achan had cover up. How do I know? It was in his tent that he buried the thing, even if he had sent all his family members on an errand to dig that place and bury them. When they came back, they would have seen fresh dirt somewhere. They should have asked questions. This thing that we do, we say, let us quickly cover it. It is not, my, it is not for me to say. You have a flatmate, you go to church together, the same church. Both of you are in the choir. This person is, person is sleeping around and you are like, well, it doesn't matter. Do you recognize that every time this person picks up the microphone in church with everybody else, he weakens the grace of God in that place? Do you recognize that? So how can you say it's not my business? I'm just minding my business. What does the Bible say about us being our brother's keepers? You say, but if I tell, it will be like I'm telling on them. I'm snitching. Oh, no, it's not snitching. What I'll do is I will first of all tell you that I'm going to tell the team. And the day I'm going to tell the team, you will be there. So it's not that I'm snitching. I'm not trying to call one person to tell them what is happening or what isn't happening. My brothers and sisters, we are on a journey. The Lord wants to do great things. Sin is a reproach. We must condemn it. We must be careful to make sure we go to God every time for our instructions. Do not presume. Presumption we get you in trouble. Presumption, we get you in trouble. Presumption, we get you in trouble. 
I'm so grateful that we are not in the days of Achan. I.e. no one is going to pull us out and stone us to death. But we need to go back to the days of the Corinthians. Where someone can actually be benched in church because of unsavory behavior. Where someone can actually be taken out of ministry for a while so that he can do the work of restoration. We ought not to know that someone is full of it and yet clap for them simply because there is some money coming out of it. This is not what we are called to do. We are gatekeepers for these things. Do not presume and do not wink at sin. My prayer is that God will help us in Jesus' name. So there is a restoration in the place of repentance. The question would be, when we get to that place, will we repent? Will we repent? You will say, did Joshua repent? Yes, didn't you hear that he put dust in his head? head, And he laid on the floor. In those days, that is repentance. It's a new season, no doubt. The opportunities will be exciting, no doubt. But as exciting as the opportunities will look to you, you want to make sure that that opportunity is one that God has given to you. Do you want to get yourself into things that you wouldn't begin to explain? One man that messes up will affect all of us. This is the time to beg your brothers and your sisters. Make them a commitment. I will not mess up as the Lord helps me. Please don't mess up so that it doesn't come and affect me. Husbands, make the commitments to your wife. Wives, make the commitments to your husband. Parents, make the commitment to your children. Children, make those commitments to your parents. Church, make the commitment to each other. This is the conversation. Sin will bring too much of a reproach. And we don't want to be those people. We must trust God in this season. That what he has said he would do for us, he would do. But in getting him to do those things, we must do the things that we ought to do. By the time we get to chapter 8, we will see how the Lord is available to restore. And my prayer is that even if in this moment there's someone flat on their face, that the Lord, the God of mercy, will reach us with mercy in Jesus' name. There is so much that the church can become in the nests. The question is, are we up to the task or are we hiding trouble? Is there an Achan in our camp? You say, what happened with Achan? He was just greedy. He wanted his reward now. His reward was a chapter away, but he wanted it now. Will you wait for your gratification to come in the time that the Lord has ordained it? Or will you pull it forward by force? The Bible says the bread of the seeds is not good at all. Say it becomes like gravel in the mouth. Do not let us be those people. Whether we like it or not, whether you believe it or not, whether it makes sense to you or not, the standard in the nest is not a standard to play with. My God is, my prayer is that God will help us Amen. to uphold that which he has committed in our hands. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. If you're on this call and you didn't give your life to Jesus yet, today is a good day to say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. In my nest, oh God, I want to be one of those who you can use and use well. I want to be one of those ones who will stand on the instructions within the parameters of the instructions that you have given us. So, I, I am asking you, Lord Jesus, today to come into my life. The prayer is simple. Say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Finally, you need to understand that what the Lord is building in the nest is what will endure. And so there is no rush and there is no hurry. We need to be our brother's keepers. If you see me falling down, please feel free to send me a message and say, Sister B, that's not how you used to do. 
this one that you're doing, it's making me uncomfortable. I will go back and take a look at it. If it is a miscommunication, I would try and clarify with you. But no, we cannot take things for granted anymore. We cannot take things for granted anymore. We will not take things for granted in our nest. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We've come to the end of chapter 7 of the book of Joshua. On Wednesday, we'll go to chapter 8. Thank you so much for being part of this, of, of this class um, and for keeping a date with us. May the Lord bless you. Amen. May he be gracious to you. Amen. May the light of his countenance shine upon you. Amen. And may he bring you to great peace. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again. Thank you. I'll see you on Wednesday, on Wednesday for a continuation of this class. Amen. Have a fantastic rest of your weekend. God bless you. Bye-bye.